Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Dennis Edwards, Dean here at North Park Theological Seminary, and we are very glad that you're here. I'm very excited for this opportunity, this faculty colloquy. I don't think we've had one since I've been here, so this is a, a treat and a joy. Um, you'll hear from our three newly installed chairs. That's, as you see, Dr. Max Leach, Dr. Michelle Dodson, and Dr. Anna Andre in that order. I want to take a moment to pray, but before I do, I'll let you know that um, some of you, most of you know your way around this building and uh, you can find your way to the restrooms and all of that. And there's refreshment in the kitchen, but um, there will be some breaks between each presentation. So we do, so hopefully you won't have to get up and, and walk in front of the screen and all that or go out to the cold. But I also want to welcome those folks who are joining online. We have a pretty robust community online and there'll be an opportunity for some questions after each presentation. Let me take a moment to pray. Dear God, for the gift of this day, we give you thanks. You are great and greatly to be praised. You're good. Your mercies endure forever. Your faithfulness is to every generation. Your mercy is new every morning. We pray now, Lord God, with thanksgiving for this community that we are a part of in North Park. And I thank you for my three colleagues, and I pray that by your spirit, you would give them the um, comfort, the energy, the clarity of thought to communicate things that you have placed in their hearts, things they've been thinking about, working on, wondering about, and that they could share those things with us, and that we would hear, listen well, and engage well. So we pray for this fruitful time, and that this will be just a glimpse of what um, happens here at North Park and what can be the case for um, more people to experience. So Lord, let your will be done. We pray and give this time to you in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 To be here, our first presenter is Dr. Max Lee the Paul W. Brendel Chair of Biblical Studies. His presentation, as you can see here in the program, Be Loud and Race for Impact, Anti-Asian Violence, the Model Minority Myth, and the Martyrs of Revelation 7, 9 through 17. Please welcome Dr. Lee. Thank you. Good morning. It's great to see everyone this morning. Thank you for showing your support and attending. I um, especially want to give a shout out to my family, my wife Sue, my eldest son Zach, and my youngest, who just flew in from California last night, whether they wanted to or not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, the, the title is Be Loud and Brace for Impact because when one is loud against injustice, uh, the, the institutions to which you who are perpetrating justice will fight back. And so, but it shouldn't um, keep us from seeking God's kingdom first and God's righteousness. And that includes God's justice for the world. And so as we seek it, we have to be prophetically loud and we should be raised for impact. And that has been a mixed history uh, in, among Asian Americans in this country. So I'll rehearse some of this. Uh, but before, before I begin, uh, I wanted to uh, highlight uh, the text that we'll be reading for intercultural reading of the Bible, and what the and what the way I approach this topic is that I do use traditional uh, tools of exe exegesis. So I look at the historical cultural context of the first century and try to understand what the text is saying. But then I ask the question: Well, how does that speak to interculturally the communities today? Um, what analogs can be drawn from the text? What new meanings uh, to new communities with the grain of the text, not if never again the grain? And what kind of challenges to action can our communities expect? So let me read from Revelation chapter 7, just the NRB uh, version. I'll fine tune some of the translation as we go. Um, after this, I looked up. So this is John the Seer, and he sees, I think, a very famous scene, a resurrection scene. There was a great multitude. Um, the Greek word is myriadas. That means uh, thousands upon thousands, so an, an uncountable number that no one could count. 
from every nation, all tribes and peoples and languages. And standing before the throne, parentheses of God, and before the Lamb, robed in white with palm branches in their hand. They crowd in a loud voice saying, salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, singing amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. I think we can all say amen. amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, who are these? Robed in white, where have they come from? I said to him, sir, you are the one that knows. Then he said to me, these are they that come out of the great ordeal, or great trials, great trials. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. In other words, they not only endured persecution and suffering with absolute fidelity, but God was there. Because um, sometimes in the pursuit of justice, we make mistakes. We sin too. And that's why the blood of Jesus assures us that as we seek God, he'll wash us from our iniquity. And he'll always give us a new start. And so I think the, the challenge has always been what is praised about the martyrs, uh, the witnesses, like martyrs more widely. What does it mean to be a witness of Christ? It's what binds the great multitude together. Uh, is the fact that Jesus is there. He gives us power. He gives us when we stumble and fall and make mistakes. And there's always a chance to re-engage in the mission of God. God has never given up on us, so we shouldn't give up on ourselves nor one another. What I would like to do is make two quick exegetical observations and then I'll, and then move a little bit more quickly than I'm used to to your culture means the Bible. <laughs> if, you, uh, if you want to challenge me the exegetical observations, I'm free to dialogue with you Q and A. But it's kind of the iceberg under the sea, sea, and I want to talk about what's above the surface a little bit more. So two exegetical observations, and some of these insights come from this wonderful anthology of essays edited by David Rhodes. And this particular first insight comes from Gusto Gonzalez in his essay on this passage. Uh, one is that this is the gathering of God's resurrected people. And at the resurrection, note, you can still distinguish between every nation, every language, every tribe, every tongue. So culture as a corporate expression of human beings in the image of God is retained. Our ethnic and cultural location is not erased. It's transformed. So it, like human beings who are fallen, um, we don't get erased at the resurrection. There's a continuity between the old and the new. In the same way, corporately as communities, uh, culture bears the image of God, but it's not untainted by sin. So at the resurrection, whatever cultural expressions of our corporate image of God as human beings, that gets transformed. The sin gets expunged or uh, and our, the old creation gets renewed and we are transformed. And so we don't know what it looks like at the resurrection, but we will still be able to distinguish each other from every nation, every tribe, every tribe. And that's Mr. Gonzalez's great argument in this essay. And the second exegetical observation I want to make is that the basis of unity of the great multitude is their faithful witness to the land despite persecution and suffering. So that means that um, as Christ followers, we should be unafraid to enter into spaces where at fidelity to God and love of neighbor, nevertheless, those spaces will inevitably bring about suffering as a broken fallen world tries to hammer us out of our obedience. And nevertheless, these martyrs, uh, were these witnesses. So, so the word for uh, witness is martyr. So I'm kind of using more gender. When we bear a witness to Christ and his kingdom, we're all martyrs. And so what Revelation 7 speaks to is that it's not diversity for diversity's sake. You know, it's, it often bothers me that people celebrate the diversity of the kingdom, but what is the basis of that unity in the diversity? Diversity that's retained at the resurrection. And it is our fidelity to the Lamb. 
and our willingness to suffer because we do seek God's kingdom first. We do seek his righteousness, including God's justice for the world. And we know what it means to be hammered by a broken, fallen world. Uh, even friends and neighbors that unknowingly do not know that maybe they're kicking against the goats and standing against the gospel. And nevertheless, in our fidelity, uh, we're, we try to be as blameless as we can and per persevere. And it is God who sustains us. It is grace that enables us. And it is the blood of the Lamb that forgives us, even when we make mistakes in that journey. So those are two exegetical observations. And now I want to apply that to two competing narratives. What is the true narrative and what is a myth? Um, but before I do that, let's talk about Asian Americans so that we have the same terms. So what is an Asian American? Um, and this is take, so this, this is both taken from a census that uh, NPR reported on, on Asian American Pacific, uh, during their Asian Pacific, Asian Pacific Islander uh, Heritage Month um, a couple of years ago. Um, the term originated in 1968 at Cal Berkeley as part of a wider ethnic studies movement um, in the University of California educational system. Uh, most Asian Americans do not identify themselves as Asian Americans. We identify themselves as Korean American or Chinese American or Filipino American. We usually refer to our ethnic descent as an identity marker. But Asian American, as the Cal Berkeley, uh, Cal Berkeley designated as, is where, um, where there is a coalescing of interests where different ethnic groups, whether East Asian, Southeast Asian, Pacific Island, or South Asian, um, there's a coalescing of struggle. Uh, there, uh, um, via V, a white dominant culture and that no one ethnic group is big enough to fight back. Asian Americans is a very broad collective that shows that there's a solidarity in political, social, cultural, and, and, and economic concerns. And so it's a broad designation. So I am both a Korean American, born in San Francisco, uh, raised in California, if any, and yet I am all I do self-identify as Asian American because in solidarity with other Asian ethnic groups, I, I, I have experienced bias, prejudice, suffering, threats of violence. That's all real from childhood up to today. Um, so it's a term that does originated in 1968. Um, and there are about 22 million Asian Americans, I think there's more now, uh, in the United States, which is about 7% of the nation's population. The largest group are Chinese Americans, East Asians, uh, and they are about 8.6 million people. Uh, the second largest group is Southeast Asians, uh, among Southeast Asians is Filipinos, and they represent, oh, sorry, it's Indians. It's Indians, uh, South Asians at 4.3 million. But to be honest, I think the Filipino population has just flipped that. Yeah, so, so, and so the second or third, but probably the second, largest group, Asian American group is our Filipino Americans, but at the set time of the census, it was 4 million. Uh, and what I wanted to do was, uh, Asian American is not a monolithic group. Uh, and when I talk about the model minority myth, uh, Jordan Ryan at Wheaton College uh, has made a very important point. The model minority myth tends to affect East Asians. Uh, that, uh, so that's, uh, without being too reductionist, mainly uh, Chinese Americans, Korean Americans, and Japanese Americans. Southeast Asians, when they immigrate to the States, tend to have taken on service industry employment. And so, because many of them live at the poverty level uh, and have struggled in their um, ascendancy through uh, the major American educational system, uh, they don't subscribe to the model minority myth, the model minority myth actually has been weaponized against them. And so this is primarily East Asian experience and not Southeast Asian or Pacific Islanders. And I think Jordan Ryan has made a very good point. Now, to introduce uh, what the model minority myth is, I thought it'd be nice to talk from the ground level up. Uh, this is a, a high schooler turned college student 
She's sharing about uh, her experiences growing up in, as an Asian American, predominantly white cultures. Uh, she'll name the states that she's lived in and her experience and some of the pressures she feels. So even though these might, these are pressures that maybe in wider media uh, streams, we might not have been aware or heard of, I think that any Asian American, East Asian American, listening to stories can relate to her different biographical notes. It's something that we've experienced. I've experienced it. I cannot tell you how many times that in a time when I was growing up in elementary school, uh, middle school, and high school, and this is the 80s and 90s, where the world was just not as politically correct as it was today, I've been called Jap, Chink, Goof. They confuse my ethnicity all the time. They associated, uh, they, almost everyone thinks I'm Chinese American growing up. And when I tell them that I was Korean American, they had no clue what Korea was, even though the United States fought in the war, uh, the Korean War. So these are just, I think in today's world, things have changed a little bit, but uh, even my sons growing up in Chicago experienced it. Uh, the a neighbor girl who in a benign way, I don't think she meant anything by it, uh, as my sons were coming home from school, they, she said, oh, there goes the Chinese boys. And then, and my sons are really upset about that because we're not Chinese. And then we, we're trying to explain to the father why this is not an appropriate way to address anyone. And he just didn't get it. Uh, and so uh, it's, it's not too far away. Uh, I think many millennials and Gen Zs still experience what she is going to share. So let me say the clip. And I, by the way, I, I did truncate this. So this is um, uh, from a TED Talks, which is usually about 10 minutes. I edited it and narrowed down to about, about five. So for the, for the sake of time, I'm gonna have to step out of PowerPoint to show the video. Full screen. There we go. And let's get us out. Mike and I play oh and the violin. Okay, let me let me um, but, I don't know why it's so slight. My name is Cameron okay. and I play both the piano and the violin. I aspire to someday be a doctor, and my favorite subject is calculus. My mom and dad are tiger parents who won't let me go to sleepovers, but they make up for it by serving my favorite meal every single day, rice. And I'm a really bad driver. So my question for you now is, how long did it take you to figure out I was joking? As you probably guessed, today I'm going to talk about race, and I'll start off by sharing with you my story of growing up Asian American. I moved to the United States when I was two years old, so almost my entire life has been a blend of two cultures. I eat possibly chopsticks and addicted to orange chicken, and my childhood hero was young. But having grown up in North Dakota, South Dakota, and Idaho, all states with incredibly little racial diversity, it was difficult to reconcile my so-called exotic Chinese heritage with my mainstream American self. Used to being the only Asian in the room, I was self-conscious that the first thing people noticed about me was that I wasn't white. And as a child, I quickly began to realize that I had two options in front of me. Conform to the stereotypes that was suspected of me or conform to the whiteness that surrounded me. There was no in-between. For me, this meant that I always felt self-conscious about being good at math because people would just say it was because I was Asian and not because I actually worked hard. It meant that whenever a boy asked me out, it was because he had the yellow fever and not because he actually liked me. It meant that for the longest time, my identity had formed around the fact that I was different. And I thought that being Asian was the only special thing about me. But as amusing as interactions were, oftentimes they made me want to reject my own culture because I thought it helped me conform. I distanced myself from the Asian stereotype as much as possible by degrading my own race and pretending I hated that. And the worst part was, it worked. 
The more I rejected my Chinese identity, the more popular I became. My peers liked me more because I was more similar to them. I became more confident because I knew I was more similar to them. But as I became more and more Americanized, I also began to lose bits and pieces of myself, parts of me that I could never get back. And no matter how much I tried to pretend that I was the same as my American classmates, I wasn't. The truth is, Asian Americans play a strange role in the American melting pot. We are the model minority. Society used to our success to pit us against other people of color as justification that racism doesn't exist. But what does that mean for us Asian Americans? It means that we aren't quite similar enough to be accepted, but we aren't different enough to be loved. We are in a perpetually gray zone and society isn't quite sure what to do with us. So they group us by the color of our skin. They tell us that we must reject our own heritages so we can fit in with the crowd. They tell us that our foreignness is the only identifying characteristic of us. They strip away our identities one by one until we are foreign but not quite foreign. American but not quite American. Individual, but only when there are no other people from our native country around. I wish that I had always had the courage to speak out about these issues. But coming from one culture that avoids confrontation and another that is divided over race, how do I overcome the pressure to keep the peace while also staying true to who I am? And as much as I hate to admit it, oftentimes I don't speak out because if I do, it's at the risk of being told that I'm too sensitive or that I get offended too easily or that it's just not worth it. All I can do is share my story. My name is Cameron. My favorite color is purple and I play the piano, but not so much the violin. I have two incredibly supportive, hardworking parents and one very awesome 10 year old brother. I love calculus more than anything, despite eating rice, and I'm a horrendous driver. But most of all, I am proud of who I am a little bit American, a little bit Chinese, and a whole lot of both. Thank you. All right. Okay. She articulated um, a lot of different things that we're going to unpack. So we're going to kind of deep thread and examine close up some of the themes that were brought up in her TED talk. By the way, um, I want, I, sometimes talking about race and racism, especially um, anti racial violence, it makes people feel uncomfortable. Uh, and I want to thank you for your willingness to sit here and feel a little bit uncomfortable. I feel uncomfortable too. But nevertheless, in that discomfort, if somehow we might be able to hear a call or a charge from, from the Lord um, and be convicted by it, then I think it's a journey well worth taking. And if you'll, you'll take that journey with me, we are going to get into some uncomfortable areas. But, but hopefully it'll also be illuminating. And for those of you who know any Asian Americans as neighbors, friends, classmates, it'll help us to understand our stories a little bit better as we share them and we hear them. Um, so one of the things of, that she addressed was the model minority myth. Um, that if I aim toward conformity and I accommodate uh, my, or even compromise or assimilate my uh, ethnic identity to fit better with a larger dominant culture, that there is a pathway to material and economic and um, social success that is available to me. Now, it's a myth because there are certain ceilings, unset, unspoken ceilings that are experienced by Asian Americans as they try to enter that pathway. It's a lot. And I think one of the things that um, I appreciated uh, from uh, John Cho, who, um, so trivia pursuits, and our trivia message, um, I knew John Cho, the actor, um, whose most famous role is Sulo in the Star Trek movies. Um, before he became an actor. So he was actually a college student in my Bible study group way back in University of California, Berkeley. Um, and so, um, and I, his parents happened to be gays, by the way. Um, I hope that he's still walking with the Lord. Um, I, I hope that he is. I know that Hollywood's a, a tough area to do that in. 
Um, but he had this great open ed in the LA Times, right when the COVID, COVID hit. And if you remember COVID, we had a president that blamed COVID as named COVID as a Chinese flu or virus. And he pitted the problem of its widespread um, and destructive effect tragically that took place in this country uh, to Chinese American origins or Chinese origins. And the and there is a disconnect, even though, even if the virus could be blamed by China, being Chinese and Chinese American are not the same. And what, what was more troubling was that people couldn't distinguish between Chinese Americans and other Asian Americans, whether they're Southeast, East Asian, uh, South Asian or Pacific Islander. So Joshua made this comment and he talked about the mom minority myth and he and his own personal experience with it. And I just wanted to read a couple of excerpts from the book again. Um, growing up, my parents encouraged me and my younger brother to watch as much television as possible so that we might learn to speak and act like natives. The hope was that the that race would not disadvantage us, the, the next generation, if we played our cards right. If you buy the modern morning myth, the myth is there is a success path that you can take uh, for economic and uh, material equivalency. Like Fame, as a, assuming as an actor, the model my, uh, minority myth can provide the illusion of racelessness. But putting select Asians on a pedestal silences those who question systemic justice. Our supposed to success is used as proof that the system works. And if it doesn't work for you, it must be your fault. So historically, the model minority myth has pit Asian against other people of color. And that's why I think Asian Americans, especially in a post-COVID era, should embrace the call to simply reject it and expose that to complete lie and not participate in it. Uh, never mind that 12% of us are living below the poverty line. The model minority myth helps maintain a status quo that works against other against people of all colors. But perhaps the most insidious effect of this myth is that it silences us. It seduces Asian Americans and recruits us to act on its behalf. It converts our parents, who in turn encourage us to accept it. It makes you feel protected that your passing is one of the good ones. If the corona, coronavirus has taught us anything, it's that the solution to a widespread problem cannot be a patchwork. Never has our interconnectedness and our reliance on each other been plainer. You can't stand up for some and not for others. And like the virus, unchecked aggression has the potential to spread widely. If you see it on the street, say something. If you hear it at work, say something. If you sense it in your family, say something. Stand up for your fellow Americans. Um, it's hard to believe uh, that the fourth anniversary, uh, the third anniversary, 21, uh, so this was 20, uh, let me see, sorry, I just want to name this correctly. Um, I think the 23rd anniversary is coming up this March, uh, um, March 17th of the Atlanta shooting. On March 16th, uh, 2021, a shooting spree occurred at two spas in the city of Atlanta. Eight people were killed, six were Asian American women. And 21 year Robert Aaron Long exoticized Asian American women's objectification and sex addiction. Uh, the question is, is has what has the coronavirus done? And if you look at the, the materials uh, that it's, it's amazing, there's a PDF, it's multiple pages long of uh, statistics. Stop AAPI Hate has analyzed the history of anti-Asian American violence um, before, uh, during, and after the coronavirus. And what the coronavirus did was make more visible an ongoing problem. It's not like the coronavirus created the problem. The coronavirus made visible the already ongoing problem. And the problem has not gotten better. It's, it, in fact, you can say in many ways it's growing. And the problem is, though, since the coronavirus, the problem has become less visible. And so people are less aware of that Asian virus that's ongoing. But 11,000 uh, 11, acts of hate against Asian Americans and violence have been reported to the National Coalition Stop API since 2020. And the start of the COVID-19 uh, virus, nearly half, 49% of Asian Americans nationwide have experienced discrimination or unfair treatment that may be illegal. 
This range is from harassment, physical assault, avoidance and shunning, online misconduct, uh, cough or spat on, job discrimination in a hostile work environment, graffiti, vandalism, robbery, and theft, uh, refusal of service, bar from transportation, uh, microaggression, uh, treating other people differently, calling the police, negative interactions with the police, uh, many different ways to express this. And the, what I want to get to, and I'm going to speed things up a little bit, um, is that this is not new. Um, what is the real narrative for Asian Americans in this country? It's not the minor bottom on earth and it. It's a lot. And so if, uh, one of the things that I've enjoyed at North Park is that I've taught a cult class on their cultural readings of the Bible. And I've had students who had to present on Asian American histories, Latin American histories, and African American histories in this country. Uh, and I'm going to use some of their slides as a tribute to that. I'm very proud of some of their work that they've done. But Mark Twain had this great line that says, history never repeats, it. It repeats itself, but it does often lie. So you can see patterns in history. And the pattern of anti-Asian violence since post-COVID is indicative of a larger anti-racial bias against Asian Americans. That's a lived part of our story, and we should embrace it, name it, persevere through it, and seek an end uh, to all the unjust spaces that we inhabit. Uh, so shout out to my past parents and my PA helped me do some of this research. Um, one big incident, and this and a, a book recently came out last year, From a Whisper to a Rally Cry, The Killing of Missing Chan. Um, it, so in 1982, uh, because auto workers were laid off, blaming the Japanese auto industry. So I don't know if you met, some people weren't even born in the 80s. So, so in the 80s, the American auto industry was in a crisis because Japanese automakers were selling their cars you know, out of the lot uh, and, and American car makers were struggling. People were laid off. And uh, there was a, a blaming of the Japanese car industry with the declining American uh, 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 economy. And so they targeted um, Asian Americans in general, not being able to distinguish between Japanese Chinese, East Asian, Southeast Asians, et cetera. Um, and, and, a, and, and a tragedy was that Vincent Chen, who was not even Japanese, but Chinese, was beaten unconscious outside a Detroit restaurant by a baseball bat, and he died in the hospital. And, but this became a big rallying cry for Asian Americans. In other words, his mother uh, um, sponsored, uh, organized, and, and, and sustained an ongoing coalition among Asian Americans against violence nation. Uh, and so uh, and this and so we have a history of actually marching against injustice, nonviolent engagement with a, a violent systemic system. And this is and the history of Asian American discrimination is not new. It can go back all the way to the Naturalization Act of 1790 which limited naturalization, and this is quote, this is in the documents. Ones who immigrate to the States, the only ones who can be naturalized were free white persons of good character. Um, and a shout out to Christy Dean and Adam Alaraj for this, this uh, 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 slide. Um, the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 prohibited all immigration Chinese laborers for 10 years, including merchants, teachers, students, travelers, and diplomats. Um, the Geary Act of 1892 extended it, the Immigration Act of 1921 prevented immigration from all of Asia altogether. 1913, the California Alien Land Act prohibited Japanese farmers from owning any land, even though they were the premier uh, uh, industry leaders in revolutionizing agriculture in the state. Uh, they brought all, everything they learned from their time in Hawaii and brought it to California. Um, by the way, uh, side note, uh, Korean farmers were the inventor of the nectarine. Uh, they are the ones that combine the plum with peach. So, uh, just a little, why I say that? Uh, <laughs> in 1942, I think one of the most tragic pieces of unjust legislation was Executive Order 9066, the Japanese internment. And this is a special part of the Chicago story because after the internment in Mandazar and other relocation centers, these Japanese families were placed in the Midwest. Chicago has a thriving Japanese American community, one of the largest Japanese American churches in this country. The Japanese American Service Center has cataloged the entire relocation and the experience, and it's well worth visiting their exhibit. 
Um, they won't follow. So I'm not naming or claiming. But um, so what has this anti Asian bias done is produce fear, real fear. And I want to name but not blame. So I'm not judging here. And I'm going to share an anecdotal story about my mother, my, my son's grandmother, was that when people, um, when anti Asian violence came out and Chinese Americans were targeted, uh, she started wearing this shirt. She not only started wearing this shirt, she sent it to my wife, she sent it to her, my, my sister in law, because what it says is that I'm not Chinese American, I am Korean. And, and notice that you have the hearts. And this is actually, I mean, from a marketing standpoint, this is really smart. These shirts just took off, but it shows a problem. Rather than solidarity with those who are persecuted, fear drives people apart, even within Asian American circles. Um, and what I always find troubling is that when there's anti Asian violence against uh, um, uh, especially women, that African American perpetrators seem to be highlighted more in the in the media, even though there is an equal amount of white and uh, uh, white perpetrators who engage, but they don't they don't get as the big news coverage. And so um, now that we're going to get into some uncomfortability, uh, I want to acknowledge. That there has been a history of division between African Americans and Asian Americans. And I want to call an input. Um, uh, these things were exasperated in the Rodney King LA riots when in March 3, 1991, um, at a protest at, of the uh, Rodney King verdict, where he was brutalized by police. And this is a whole episode that, uh, that was caught on film. Um, the response to the African American community was, was anger when they, all, all the policemen in, involved in the assault were. Uh, found innocent, and so no charges were, were placed, no jail time, nothing. So the African American community, um, uh, not let me say this: some members of the African community. That's the best way to put it. Not everyone. Um, out of this anger, uh, they actually target. Okay, thank you. Um, oh, okay, okay. Uh, they actually uh, 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 they they targeted Korean stores because. There's a long history of conflict, racial conflict. Uh, if you go to any LA cream store in the 80s, the managers were Asian and then um, other ethnic workers, Latino and African American, uh, Latinos mostly were the workers, and there and African Americans didn't feel served or even seen. And so when these came out, uh, they were targeted as those that perpetuated. Um, a larger system in which African Americans felt alienated. Um, but, and I, I mentioned this because, but at the same time, something beautiful came out of that. Um, the churches responded by African and Asian American churches. Well, this is not as uh, well advertised, but they had a peace walk that same week, calling for peace in the neighborhood. And I think this is what we need to do more. We have to know that for Asian Americans, this is part of our folklore history and our identity and our heritage. Um, right now, the two biggest groups that have experienced discrimination in COVID-19, interesting enough, for different reasons, are African Americans, Asian Americans. These are the two largest ethnic groups. And so, what I, even though there's progress, and here, so here's, um, for example, Asian American Christians, uh, 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 Asian American Christian Collective, have organized several Black Lives and Dignity Marches, um, one of which uh, I uh, and Sue and I believe my eldest son also participated in. Um, it's a start. We're starting to work. And so Charlie Gates of Progressive Baptist Church is a big co-worker and co-organizer and an ally in this, in this march. But it was our way to say that we know what it means to be persecuted because of our social and ethnic location. We join that this must end. And so uh, I'm gonna move forward a little bit for the sake of time. So what should we do? Um, my call is to reject unjust systems. That is what it means to seek God's kingdom first and his righteousness. And to be loud and the brace for impact. And so Asian Americans today need to know their history. That the model minority myth, and these are some great books that I often teach in my class, Straight from a Different Shore, The Making of Asian America. There's all those other websites, the uh, Asian American uh, Island Equity Alliance. 
Um, and let's slam evil together. Okay, and, and the word comes from the slain lamb. This is Brian Blount's uh, great uh, analysis of reading revelations in light of the civil rights movement. Uh, what, he, what he notices, and I'm, I'm gonna uh, uh, talk about, so this slam evil. I, mean, I wish I could come with these terms. <laughs> it's brilliant. So the way of the slain lamb is to slam evil. This is just like brilliant. Okay, all right. So let me just uh, explain what's going on. Um, uh, do not become overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Asian Americans should prophetically challenge injustice and ally themselves with a shared heritage uh, with other people of color who also experience injustice against institutions where it thrives. The unjust system may react to the Lutheran church by trying to silence her. The church is called not to return evil with evil, but return it with good. As the institution continues to return evil in response to church's good, however you find it, Martin Luther King Jr. defined it that at the very least, he can't think of using violence in a way that doesn't promote more violence. And so he embraced pacifist ethic. Um, uh, so, but as the institution returns uh, evil in response to the church's good, it'll, it will be, ex the, the institution will be exposed to the smell of what it really is, sinful. And exposure is an act of God, it requires initiative from prayer of the church. But the evil institution does is not just human agency. In fact, because I think those outside the church actually do, even do this better. It, prayer precedes the work of the church. God has to unveil evil. No, just because I return a person's um, good, uh, evil to me with good is no guarantee that I would be aware of the evil that they're doing. But, but in that mysterious sphere where I, by faith, I do try to overcome evil, not with more evil, but good, God works. He unveils. And he might just rescue not just those who have been victims of injustice, but even the victimizers. Mm -hmm. And this is the way of the early Christian church. I'll end here. It's called the Jane Effect. The, the early Christian church was in the position of marginalization, not power. If you want to know what it means to think of things systemically, actually, uh, uh, the Old Testament and the theocracy of Israel and its Torah laws are, are a better place to look. The church was against the Roman Empire. The church had to deal with uh, a broken and fallen system that they had no way to overturn, and nor did they seek to overturn it violently. But what they did was, as they continued to, so here's the system at work. What happens is, as they try to silence me uh, and they return my good with more evil and I can keep on returning my their evil with my good and God works in this one by one like Jenga blocks you know what the Jenga blocks do you take a block at one time one by one they want people into the church and the big question is how many people in that system you rescue before the entire system collapses but it happened within the first three centuries of, of, of the early Christian church. By the time of Constantine, Christianity was everywhere. Why? Because of the Jacob effect. And so marginalization is not a place of powerlessness. It's an opportunity to experience the power of God. So that I end. <laughs> I don't know if we have quite time for questions. I know that was okay. Oh, that's great. Thank you. I got the five minute signal. And I <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'd love to hear any questions about the content. And I thank you for racing through the comfortableness, but I hope that you were encouraged at the end because that, in the end, God's word lifts us up. Yes, Meredith. Um, the verse you opened with, the yeah. Revelations. Yes. Yeah. Um, I was just thinking about how present there, we usually think of humans present there, but it also has the four creatures. Yeah, the yeah, absolutely. And so the angels are likely there too. And yeah. just thinking about what you said at the end, yeah. how um, we need to have spiritual prayer yeah. you know, before we enter into these battles. Yeah, yeah. So it's just interesting to see how it's both realms that are 
page. Oh yeah, uh, that I'm, I'm glad. Revelation is really good about that. So Revelation is in fact about looking at what's happening in the first century world, especially the tyranny of the Roman Empire. Um, uh, and what Revelation does is lifts the veil behind the curtain of human history. That this is not just a human struggle. There are real forces of evil at work, and people are caught up in those systems. Um, I think one of the things that always helpful for me that he so when we're on the other end of violence, it's hard to have pity for the, the victimizer. But the scandal of the gospel has always been, you want to rescue both the victim and the victimizer. And if we can think of uh, the analogy of fever, that the victimizer is so caught up in the rhetoric and the lies and the system and, and the systems that are, that are uh, escalating the violence in the person, it, it's like they have a fever, they can't think straight. And it takes the brave witness of the church to return not evil with good and the agency of the Holy Spirit to wake up that person from their fever and then they'll be open to the gospel. And so they, it is not a battle of just flesh and bone, but it is a spiritual battle. Yes. Valerie, Valerie Lampair yeah. online has a short comment, a yeah. couple follow-up questions. Yeah. Quick to lead her comment. Yeah. First, studies indicate that racial biases develop early in childhood, like three months old, oh, yeah. show preferences, yeah. that kind of thing, right? Nine months, they yeah. categorize space by race. Yeah. By age three, children in the U.S. began attributing negative traits, so that kind of comment, up through those early years. Mm -hmm. For first question, having this data, would you reconsider your statement regarding, I think, the nine-year-old and the in the your neighborhood, um, she did not know any better. Okay. And the second question is, why do you think some people of color, even when having the difficult discussion about racism, continue to minimize racist acts? Okay, two tough questions. Thank you, Val. Shout out to Val. She's an alumnus of North Park, and, and, and uh, I've always appreciated her prayers throughout these many years as, as just a personal friend. Um, so. I, in the case of the child, I would blame the parents more than the child. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the um, challenges of being a parent in this world. So um, I often say, whether if I was invited to, to pray at a baptism service, for example, or, or child dedication, that the parent is the first theologian of any child. Mm -hmm. And that's a great burden. Because if I bear a false witness to who God really is, that child will be formed, formed by that false witness. Mm -hmm. So that's the answer to the first question. The second, um, can you repeat the second question? Um, yes. Why do you think some people of color, even when having the difficult discussion about racism, mm -hmm. continue to minimize racism? Yes. So... Um, well, I think, I think for the Asian American side, it's because people still believe in the model minority myth. And that's, that, it has to be exposed as, as, as a lie. Um, I, so I think this is tough among East Asians because they are, many times they see a pathway to success and they knuckle their way through it. You just give Asian Americans a crack, that's all they want is a crack, and they'll just kind of uh, try to plow their own path. And I think we need to slow down. I think COVID taught us to slow down, that even if people are successful, um, there are certain unseen ceilings. Um, I'm grateful for North Park's appointment as chair, but I can count on the number, on two hands, the number of Asian American chair professors. We're few and far between. And, and I think a lot of it has to do with the politics of, of different institutions, sometimes because they are the most senior and most accomplished uh, uh, scholars, but I don't see them getting named chairs mm -hmm. or being invited as plenary speakers to certain events, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So that's just in my, my field or deal. You'll, and so I think that the modern minority myth, at least my Asian Americans have, has been too successful. Mm -hmm. And it's time now to be loud against it. And then, and, it, and I don't know what sort of repercussions that will bring but it will invite hostility. And the call to saints, not just Asian Americans, all saints, is whenever hostility hits, hits us to persevere through it, seek God's kingdom first and his righteousness.
Oh, yes. There's another one here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Do you want to? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. <laughs> Natalie Liu. Okay, yes. Asks, as you teach Asian American history and histories of people of color, how has it been received by students here at North Park? Oh, yeah. Um, I think it's been mixed. I think I, I, I um, I think, I guess the best way to put it is this, when they are undergrads, have they ever taken ethnic studies, Asian American history course, isn't even offered at their, at their uh, uh, undergrad institution. So when I grew up, uh, not grew up, I don't know, when I was, grow up, when I went to college, when I went to college, that's what I meant. So uh, uh, you see, the University of California Berkeley was famous for its Asian American studies major. It was one of the first in the California system. Uh, Ron Dukaki, back then, who's since passed away, his, strain, his book was Strange from the Different Stores that traced Asian American history. It was a, an all out bestseller. And he was a phenomenal speaker. I remember I'm sitting in a hall and I'm thinking, there's 500 people here. And then he would, he would talk about Star Trek. And all of a sudden, I, who was a trekker and loved Star Trek, started hating Star Trek because I didn't see about, I didn't understand all the interracial biases that are, that, are, that are being promoted from the 1960s film. So now I became a little bit more critically aware of, of how media portrays or Hollywood portrays Asian Americans among other ethnicities. So um, I think that I had some who took classes like that. So for them, this was rehearsed ground, but now that the class, what it does, it helps them think pastorally about their congregations. That this is a part of their work in ministry. Uh, and then I think there are those that never had any exposure to this and the class is an eye awakening experience. So I think I've had different sectors. I do think that, and I, and I wanna say that I've always really appreciated um, white brothers and sisters who took this class because they knew there were times where they felt comfortable, but the class, it, it, it works best when there is a safe space for honest dialogue. And I would hope uh, times to confess where we might have done wrong and the beauty of repentance and changing. Mm -hmm. And so those, have, it, those are the things, those moments in the class is what have made this course so worthwhile to teach. And that's an indirect mm -hmm. plug. Please take this question. <laughs> So, so Someone who got to um, well, for one semester yeah. got to coach. Yeah, and then great. Right. And they got the guest in that class. Um, I also put a big plug for it. It helps you to buy the max course on a book. And um, yeah, I'm a oh, so yeah, I'm sorry. Sorry. So this presentation is the raw material for chapter. The book that I, Dean Dennis, uh, and another scholar, Latina scholar, the Vietnam Dennis at Fresno State University, is a textbook on his book review for Bible. Right. Well, thank you, Max. And um, I'm sure there'll be some more questions. Let's take four minutes. Can you four minutes? Mm -hmm. And then be back here. And then uh, you'll hear from Dr. Dodson.
Stop up the car. Clean its kitchen. And just look at some emails and yeah. Yeah. And that's all I got. I want to start with a walk. Okay. Sounds good. I think we should wash your jacket this weekend too. It's got lots of spots on it. of its barn bears witness to this. Speaking of the significance of the barn and what giving it would represent, Ingebrigtsen wrote, this could be the movement right here. that would force open the gates of peace. You can't see that one. It's currently blocked by hatred, racism, and mistrust. We hold the key in our small way to share what we have been given to demonstrate the love of Christ and to help improve the chances for peaceful, orderly development of the world, rather than for increased anger and rage. Sure. We that we fell in this hour of prejudice. In researching a bit more into the life and work of Dr. Inga Gretzen, I have been struck not only by his passion for his evangelism, You're doing it, Mike. You're not doing it. Way to go. And evangelism do not represent an either or paradigm, but rather the two go hand in hand. I resonate deeply with this. In my work, I am particularly interested in multiracial churches. So fun. You got to do it. <laughs> and their potential to be a Super powerful sweet. <laughs> Enjoy your walk. work in the world and to be sites where racial justice and racial healing can happen. My research interests are deeply personal mm -hmm. and grow out of my desire that all may know Christ and experience his promise abundant life. So I am delighted to be able to share my work with you all today. Thank you for being here. Because I don't know how to use Christ for the next year until I got this life line. Amen. <laughs> 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 So today I'm going to talk to you about findings from my most recent study. At the outset, let me say that this work centers on Protestant multiracial churches. Much of the research on such churches, especially earlier work, has focused on three things. One, describing them. Michael Emerson and Karen Kim's 2003 work is an example of this. Um, it's in this work that we get the 80-20 ratio that I'm sure a number of you are familiar with, but this has become sort of the baseline for characterizing a church as multiracial. Two, exploring how such churches uh, sustain their racial diversity. And here the work of Gerardo Marty has been important as well as Corey Edwards' 2008 work and more recently, Jessica Barron and Reese Williams, 2014 work. And then finally, understanding racial attitudes of people who attend multiracial churches. George Yancey's 2004 work um, and Yancey and Emerson's 2003 work are good examples. Recent scholarship has turned more a more critical eye towards the impact of these churches on the racial status quo. And many of you may be familiar with Jamar Tisby's 2019 work, which is a good example of this. And this is where um, my work is situated. Having been involved with many different multiracial churches over the past 20 years and helping to plant two of them, I've come to understand that these churches are not monolithic in how they treat race. And so it's reasonable to suspect that the impact they are having in the world is also varied. So with this in mind, I came to the project with two research questions. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the first, how does the church's racial discourse shape its social engagement? Said another way, what is the relationship between the way a church uh, represents race through talk, text, and imagery, and how that church engages with the larger community in which it is situated? My second research question grew out of my understanding that churches can have um, a direct impact on their communities through their social engagement, but they also can have an indirect impact by influencing congregants who then go out and impact their communities. And so drawing on the 
work of Gregory Stanzig, I conceptualized this indirect impact as engaged spirituality. Stanzig defines engaged spirituality as a spirituality that both motivates and sustains a person's social activism. He highlights four ways that one's spirituality can become engaged. A person can inherit engaged spirituality from parents and family. Engagement can be learned. It can be sparked by a social encounter with injustice. Or one's spirituality can become engaged through uh, a spiritual epiphany. So my second research question was how effective are multiracial churches at sparking engaged spirituality? There are two notable examples of engaged spirituality that um, I saw in the field that I want to highlight here. So the first was a congregation <laughs> service um, of five high schoolers at one of the churches that participated in the study. So during this um, service, those the young people were they gave confessions of faith before their community, and then they read personal statements. Now, these statements were, um, were their own to write. They were given a lot of freedom in terms of what they chose to talk about. But to a person, each student connected their faith in very concrete ways to some issue um, related to justice. And they talked about how they were actively engaged with those issues. And, and most importantly to me, <laughs> um, to a person, each one of them named their church as having been hugely instrumental in helping them to make that concrete connection. Another example um, came from a black man that I spoke to um, at another Presbyterian church, Michael. So he told me in his words that he had not really been the marching type prior to coming to the church. He shared that it wasn't that he was against marching or other forms of demonstration, but there had never been an issue that he felt rose <laughs> high enough to make him want to go outside and do that. <laughs> And so what changed him was, again, in his words, hearing a white woman share one Sunday about protests that she had been participating in. So this woman had two young children, and she had been bringing them with her to various different demonstrations. And so he said that hearing her conviction and her passion sparked something in him and forced him to rethink the way he had been thinking about participating in demonstrations and marching. And so um, at the time of our interview, he had participated in many. <laughs> I'm gonna get, you're gonna see this bright yellow. This was my attempt at North Park. <laughs> so to answer my research question, I did a qualitative analysis of four multiracial congregations located in Chicago. Between October 2020 and May 2021, I conducted 40 uh, semi-structured in-depth interviews and over 20 informal interviews with congregants. In addition, I spent a total of 86 hours in the field as a, partic a participant observer. During this period of data collection, I spent at least one month at every church, or at most. Um, I attended all of their Sunday services and special events. I attended staff meetings when allowed. I participated um, in all the ministries that they offered whenever possible. So there were months when there was overlap. Um, for example, during the month of December, I attended all churches, Christmas services and Christmas Eve services and all, all services. <laughs> Included among the interviewees were um, the lead pastors, associate pastors, and executive pastors of each church. With the exception of Circle Church, you'll hear about that just later, um, whose lead pastors were on sabbatical during the period of data collection. The congregants that I interviewed were either referred to me by their pastors or were people I connected with while I was serving and observing the churches. I focused my attention on interviewing members or regular attendees who actively participated in church-sponsored outreach ministries directly, directly related to justice. Uh, and the questions that I asked centered on how they um, understood or connected their service in the church and outside of the church to their faith and to justice, and what role they saw their church in playing in sort of fostering or um, helping to sustain their spiritual engagement. And lastly, I did historical analysis of each church um, in my sample. 
both Key Church and Cornerstone Church um, have long and rich histories in their respective communities. The four churches that graciously participated in my study were, Re were Revival City, led by Pastor James, located um, just outside the West Loop, Cornerstone Presbyterian, led by Pastor Nathan on the south side of Chicago, Key Church, which was co-led by Pastor Jenny, um, who was the lead pastor, and Pastor Freedom Warrior, the executive, executive pastor, located in the near north neighborhood, and last, the Circle Church, <clears throat> also co-led by husband and wife duo Renee and Richard in the West Loop. So I should say now that all of the names that you are hearing and will hear, um, including the names of the churches, are pseudonyms. And um, the interviewees were allowed to choose their own pseudonym. <laughs> I need to say that after. <laughs> so Revival City and Circle Church both identify as non-denominational churches. Cornerstone is a mainline church, and Key Church identifies itself as um, multi-denominational. All four churches in my study easily met the 80-20 threshold to be considered multiracial. However, in selecting churches for this study, I also paid attention to what um, I'm calling presence. So as many of you in this room probably know, in practice, most pastors do not know the exact racial makeup of their churches, unless their churches are fairly monoracial. So this is true at my church, and it bore out in all of the churches in the study. With the exception of Circle Church, which had, rec which had recently done a professional um, survey of their congregation, none of the pastors that I interviewed could give me um, precise breakdowns of the racial demographics of their members and attendees. And even in the case of Circle Church, uh, though their estimates were more accurate, they were still estimates. And this is a good thing, right? Because that means that churches are changing. <laughs> People are coming in and coming out. So you don't, we probably don't want to be able to look out at our congregation every Sunday and know, yes, I can count exactly how many of all of the people are here. So that said, the strength of the 80-20 ratio is that it points to the importance of that 20% threshold. Once any group makes up 20% of another group, their, um, their presence starts to be felt. This is true whether you're talking about neighborhoods or congregations. And so in my selection criteria, I paid attention to whether the presence of ethnic minorities and racial minorities in each church was felt. I took note of who the stakeholders were. And I defined stakeholders within the church as those who don't have any formal title and may not be serving in um, a formal ministry, but who demonstrate ownership. They can often, um, this can often be seen in how they welcome newcomers or in the connections that they have with various ministries in the church. These are the people who have the pastor and the leadership team, that they're, they're, they have their ear, right? Um, they know who to go to. They know what's happening. So a great example of this happened um, on my first visit to Revival City Church. Um, when I, whenever I visit a church the first time, I came very, very early, as early as I could possibly come, because I want to look around and see what's going on. And so on this particular Sunday, I came in, um, and they had lots of different, you know, church swag displayed on tables. Um, and one of those tables, there was a book by Tony Evans, and it was labeled Book of the Month. And so I'm standing there, and I'm kind of looking at the book, and someone walked over to me. Um, I later learned his name was Dave. And so he came over and, you know, he's talking to me and asking me about the book. I assumed, based on the way he approached me, that he was a reader or a, an usher. So I asked him how I could purchase the book. And he's like, I have no idea. I, I'm not serving <laughs> I'm not on any ministry team. But he knew exactly who I needed to talk to. And so it was very early. Not everybody was there. They were still setting up. But he could take me down this little corridor. And he brought me to Ann, who was able to assist me. So this interaction showed me that Dave was a stakeholder. He had organizational knowledge, and he felt a sense of ownership in this church. At that moment, though not serving on that Sunday, he became a representative for the organization and took it upon himself to do the best he could to make me feel welcome. So as you can see, um, within my small sample, there is diversity with regard to denominational affiliation, congregational size, racial composition, 
and the median ages of each of the congregations. As I stated previously, one underlying assumption that I had in designing this study was that multiracial churches are not monolithic in their impacts. And so with that in mind, I created a framework to help me better analyze what I was expecting to see. And here I drew on scholarship from the fields of social discourse and whiteness studies and identified racial discourse as an important variable for my study. I also drew on the 2007 work of Fred Niss and Paul Newbrick, uh, where they introduced the concept of moral projects. Moral projects are directly related to how the congregation understands its role in the larger world. Moral projects can be collectivist or individualistic. The individualistic orientation emphasizes individual moral goods, for example, personal piety or um, enlightenment. Conversely, the primary focus of the collectivist moral project is collectivist social good as understood by the congregation. Importantly, these are not mutually exclusive. I think a healthy church should attend to both of these, but most churches tend to emphasize one over the other. Racial discourse is the whole of how people communicate around race through text and speech. This is how it's defined in whiteness um, and discourse studies. More precisely, racial discourse represents the negotiated meanings that provide a context through which action and thought can be measured. Scholars in the field of discourse and whiteness studies, such as Ashley Dome, argue that racial discourse is not passive. In other words, it's not simply a reflection of the larger social context, but rather it actively shapes the meanings that people assign to racial difference and by extension, their actions towards racial others. In my study, I broadened discourse to include not only talk, text, and imagery, but also um, the aesthetic of the church. I paid attention to the ways leaders intentionally shape the feel of their physical and virtual spaces and their services. All of these factors were important signals of what each church stood for and who each church understood of itself to be. In this framework, racial discourse can be either transcendent um, or oriented, oriented towards justice. A transcendent racial discourse centers the end of the story. The emphasis is on our oneness in Christ with only a cursory acknowledgement of the sinful barriers to that oneness. Multiracial churches oriented toward racial transcendence tend to minimize or ignore racial injustice. They may talk about race, but only as it relates to celebrating or, or creating diverse worship, worship experiences. Conversely, justice-oriented racial discourse is in line with a structural orientation towards race. This, this, this discourse emphasizes unmasking and dismantling racial racist systems as a way of living out our oneness in Christ. I argue that these two variables, moral projects and racial discourse, interact to not only produce different types of social engagement, but also different rationales for that engagement. So for example, uh, thinking about two churches that both tend toward a collectivist moral project um, but who have different racial discourses, one that emphasizes transcendence and the other that emphasizes justice. In a church with a transcendent racial discourse, uh, social engagement will primarily be aimed at creating <laughs> opportunities to directly share a gospel message, right? We want to be able to pray for somebody or tell someone about Jesus. Conversely, the church whose racial discourse is one um, of justice will be more likely to engage in social action aimed at directly addressing some issue related to injustice. Now, very important, the distinction here is not whether or not a multiracial church is interested in social justice or evangelism. These are not mutually exclusive aims. All of the churches in my study were deeply committed to witnessing Christ in their communities. They were all deeply committed to evangelism. 
evangelism. What's at issue is how a church interprets what it means to go and make disciples. For churches that emphasize racial transcendence, being able to invite people into um, a worship community that ostensibly is free from racial division is viewed as the best way of accomplishing it. Right? Where we're winning people for Christ because they come here and look at our oneness. On the other hand, churches that emphasize racial justice um, tend to focus on Jesus' command as being a call to address systemic issues that cement those divisions. Again, we can tear down those barriers so that people will come and look at our oneness, right? I found that in all four churches, there was a relationship between their racial discourse and the form of their social engagement. I was very pleasantly surprised to see that in all four of the churches, they engaged in actual versus aspirational representation on their websites. Um, having been featured on many websites that engaged in aspirational uh, diversity, this was, this was um, notable. <laughs> and so by this, what I mean is that none of the churches um, bodies of color in their digital materials to signal a level of diversity that was not actually represented in their dress. <laughs> Each of the four churches' racial discourse was one that I've called a discourse of inclusion. And this is a justice leaning racial discourse that demonstrates through talk, text, image, imagery, and aesthetic genuine concern for the lived experiences of people of color within the church and a willingness to be challenged by those experiences. And that second part is key. Not just concern for, but a willingness to be challenged by those experiences. In each of these churches, the shape of their particular discourse of inclusion was reflected in their social engagement. So First Presbyterian is a great example of this. Pastor Nathan um, used art in very intentional ways as a means of reflecting to the congregation who they were. And so the art you see here, um, this is a picture that he displayed um, during one of the, um, it was during the Epiphany service. Um, and he would always have, so there was this image um, on, on another time, it was an African scene that was also used to, to represent the, the Magi visit. He um, just used art in very creative ways. And so in response to my question about why, he uh, used art this way. He said um, that he was, and here's his quote, that I'm sort of running with this vague intention that the aesthetic of the service should reflect the aesthetic of the congregation. So if 60% of the congregation is Black, then 60% of the hymns that we um, encounter in our service should come from Black tradition. And if I think 30% of our congregation are first-generation African immigrants, then we should have some African hymns and African art. And we, we also have European immigrants and some white people in our congregation. So I'm trying to vaguely reflect those properties. And this theme of, um, of reflecting back to the congregation who they were um, was evident in the church's approach to outreach. Um, of more than any of the four churches, First Presbyterian was very intentional about the kind of outreach they engaged in. Their outreach had been diminished during COVID, um, but everything they did was in direct response to a need shared by the community. And one of their um, most significant um, initiatives was actually led by a committee comprised mostly of people who didn't go to the church. So that idea of I wanna reflect back and then the congregation seeing themselves, that is what their racial discourse looks like. And I am going to quickly speed up a little bit. So one of my key findings was that while the first part moves to <laughs> true, right, that each church's racial discourse absolutely did shape their social engagement, there was not a very clear relationship between their racial discourse and how different persons in the churches understood the reasons for doing that, so, so that social engagement. Um, so if you talked to pastors, you would walk away having a completely different view of what these churches were doing, why they were engaged in their communities, why they were engaged in the ways they were engaged in, versus if you talk to someone in the congregation. And the exception, I wanna make sure we get to this. 
Um, the exception to the rule was Revival City. All of the churches had some level of misalignment. But with Revival City, they regularly kept before the congregation what their mission was. They had a very clear connection and mission to um, um, love our neighbor, right? They wanted to seek the good of the city. And on a regular basis, they defined for their, the leaders defined for their congregation what seeking the good of the city meant, what seeking the welfare of the city meant. That was how you love neighbor, and that was deeply connected to justice. And so it was not surprising in almost every interview I had with a person in the congregation, when I asked them about why they served, why the church was doing what it was doing, they made that connection as well. And this was a stark contrast to congregants in other churches who would talk about many wonderful reasons for, for serving, almost never having anything to do with justice. And so why does this matter? So my study aimed to do three things. So first, I wanted to be able to contribute to this growing body of work that is trying to explore and answer the question, are these churches having the kind of impact we all hope they would have? Are they challenging the racial status quo? The second thing that um, my study contributes to and offers is a way of analyzing and categorizing multiracial churches that centers not on what they look like, but on what they are doing. Um, I am forever interested in what we are doing. And then lastly, and perhaps most importantly, this study highlights an important gap between what the leaders of these churches think we are doing and what we are actually doing. And so it speaks to how we are forming the people. It speaks to discipleship. So it's wonderful if churches are going out and doing good things, and we want them to do good things. But if our desire is that we're transforming the hearts of the people who are coming to our churches, then we need to be more intentional about how we talk about why we're doing these good things. Thank you. I just want to say, wow, that's an amazing amount of work and research right there. Thank you. Very, very illuminating. Um, how did, how did, do you, can you trace the process on how you, um, like, frame questions? How did you, how did you come up with analysis on the effectiveness mm. of whether multicultural churches are actually accomplishing the goal? How did you measure that? Yeah, so the, the analytic thing framework was yeah. extremely helpful for my brain. <laughs> um, when I did my, my master's work, Again, I'm always interested in what churches are doing. And so it was. It became clear to me, I did a quantitative study there and realized it's not going to help me understand what churches are doing. Yeah. And so I was on a quest to figure out how can I measure this? Like, what is a way for me to think about what I'm thinking here? Um, and so the, the impact in this study, at least, was still more based on what was reported to me by folks who were in the church. Um, and so I do want to, one of the things I'm interested in doing is talking to people who live around church and places to find out how they experience that impact. But, um, but the analytic framework was, was helpful and um, as I listened to them tell me what they were doing to be able to categorize what I was thinking. So it was all through interviews? All through interviews. And then it was a random selection you just sort of volunteers or? So it was more of a random and snowball. Okay. okay. For my, for my, so the, for the churches, if I, my criteria, and I, if, if I did the study again, I would do it differently. I didn't want to go to any church that I was very, very familiar with, which greatly limited the yeah. pool of churches. Yeah. Yeah. That I could go to. So, uh, so that was one. I didn't want to be. I didn't want to know the pastors. I didn't want to know the churches. Um, and then once I, and then I just called people and asked, like, what did you? Folk I did know what the multiracial churches could point me to. And so then I spent um, several months just visiting lots of churches and trying to figure out which ones might be good fit for me. Have you been able to share your results, if you will, with the congregation, or not the congregation, but necessarily the leadership, essentially those who weren't connected to the reality? Right. And if so, um, yeah, so I'm actually, I've, I've contacted one of the, the pastors this month or last month, 
in some time in the relative recent future or past, but uh, to do that. That was when I came into all the churches, um, I offered to come back once I had finished the study to present what I found. Uh, and so, so far, people have been really excited about that. So I'm, I'm getting my life together to be able to go back to all, all the work of churches. <laughs> But is there a difference or whether it's like in the San Francisco church as far as age of church or age of congregation? Like not their age, but in a set more established church versus a new church plant? Was that a factor? Yeah, so interesting. So two of the churches in my study had very, very long history. They had been in those in their communities for many, many, many years. And then two were newer. Um and so the the, the, the churches that were most similar in terms of their um, having left misalignment actually were a younger church and an older church. So it's it, 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 yeah. I understand your research focused on local churches, but I wonder if you would apply this to, say, denomination or even higher education. I'm particularly wondering where you put covenant in your part in your closet. Mm -hmm. Oh, I would love to speak that. So that's actually, uh, um, I think that the a next step for me is to be able to flesh out this framework by doing further analysis and seeing how other other institutions, um, other churches in other places. I think the situation in Chicago, Chicago is very different than California, right? Which is very different than Atlanta, which or Texas, right? So um, I've not yet done that. I I have to when I think about our denomination. I will have to say that my experience of our denomination is largely colored by my experiences in the two churches that I've helped to start. And often when I go to larger, you know, gatherings of our denomination, I realize how different those experiences are. So I think that um, the strength of the covenant, and I do think it's a strength, and we're very broad and diverse. So I would imagine we fall all over the place. Um, but I am interested in looking at sort of denominational leadership and being able to map that onto that that project. Um, so building on what you were saying, I was wondering, I noticed that you had only one church with a denomination, but you are the other three non denominations. And can that make a difference in the mix? Yeah, I think so. There was one uh, denominational church, the Presbyterian Church, one one overtly non-denominational, or two overtly non-denominational churches. And then one that was, it's, they call themselves multi-denominational. And when they said that, that didn't make any sense. And then as I was there, I'm like, that, that's exactly what you are. I understand why you don't make yourself. Because so this church, uh, I think it was initially planted by people who came out of um, a more high church, I think Lutheran um, orientation. But they have, they have, well, I think one of the pastors is an ex- Catholic priest. <laughs> um, they have people who are, they are all across the board, and they do try to reflect that in their services. So you, I remember sitting there the first time, and I thought, okay, this is a kind of a high church, this is a liturgical church, and then somebody pulled out a guitar and started singing, like, something like, okay, nope, that's maybe a little bit different, and then the next song was like a gospel, so I was like, okay, I don't know what I'm experiencing. <laughs> so, okay. it, was, it was very, very uh, interesting. Um, a simple question. Um, I was having a conversation with a colleague, Alan Gay, uh, Y E H, mm -hmm. and he it was, it was we were at a conference, and it was a side comment that it always, it always stuck with me is that he asked questions about how successful multicultural churches in North America context because he was in Australia. Mm -hmm. And so he's a, a Chinese American, not Chinese American, Chinese Australian. So and he said that um, what he would like to explore is that, in his opinion, multi ethnic churches, multi cultural churches in Australia are very successful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, he, and he's baffled by the non successor effectiveness. Sorry, it's my voice. <clears throat> I think my voice went out. Okay, there we go. Um, the, the, sometimes the, the the barriers that, mm -hmm. that multicultural churches eventually drift into maybe more predominantly white. So they start off mm -hmm. multicultural, but they end up being predominantly white. And he thought that that was odd because from his context in Australia, he saw the 
situation or what we call the transaction report. Um, so, yeah. so I'm just wondering, has there any, been any studies comparing the different contexts? Yeah. On the level of that? I, I'm not aware of any studies that on that, but that's really okay. like, yeah, it's very interesting. It's so now, thank you for yeah. sharing that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Our <laughs> case was wondering what tools of measure are they using right. to measure effectiveness? Right. Because I'm, I'm quite convinced by the tools we're using. I thought it was a good genius. Do you, well, I'm going to ask questions about it shortly after. Okay. <laughs> after <laughs> yeah. okay. So you had, had mentioned a gap. Mm -hmm. Between and, and it is interesting to me because it is kind of organizational right. kind of culture, so it, it fits in a lot of different contexts. So the the leaders of the church were positioning that it's justice. That's what we we're doing. Mm -hmm. You had mentioned a gap. What did the conference say? Right. Thank you, because I kind of had to rush this. Yeah. Uh, so most of the congregants talked about um, like as an, like, two examples. Um, I, I served in a, a food distribution ministry that one of the churches had. And a lot of people would come with their kids. And so they would name their reason for services. I want my kids to know the importance of giving back, right? Or I've, I've been blessed with so much that I saw what I want to give. Um, they would talk about, I, you know, I, want, I love that we can play with people. But there were, there were never, so in the, in the staff meetings, when they would look at whether or not um, a particular week was successful, they were talking about justice. Like it would come up all, on a regular basis. They would admit food insecurity would be named in those back steps. Back to yeah. those steps. Not one person that I served alongside ever mentioned food insecurity, ever mentioned growing homeless population, like none of that. Not either. Like, <clears throat> <Sorry. laughs> okay. This is a, a from online Felita Todd Hunter. Uh, she she writes. I agree that discipleship is key. The gap between leadership and congregants is a struggle. In your experience with multiracial churches, do you find that congregants perceive their work is done simply because they are attending and the person is present? Yes. <laughs> 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 mentioned George Nancy. Mm -hmm. um, one book I've read is Beyond, is it called Beyond Public Money? Mm -hmm. Beyond Racial Division. I'm interested in your horizontal, oh. the horizontal part of your mm -hmm. statement. He talks about, you know, on the one hand, colorblindness, on the other hand, anti-racism. And then his third way is a mutual accountability model. I'm just wondering if you see that on the extremes of your horizontal line mm -hmm. and in your engagement with these multicultural churches, do you feel like they're polarized in, on that? Or is there, and his mutual accountability model is about constructive conversation yeah. about polarized racial issues to move forward. Yeah. Does that play a part in your? Yeah, so I think that what's interesting about that, when I, um, went into this study and when I created this, the way I thought about racial transcendence, um, that discourse was very negative. Like it, it was, that was like, in my mind, that's the bad side and the good side is to be um, here and done. And so actually doing the study helped me to reconceptualize that a little bit. I do think if there is a, a positive for the mismatch within the, the congregation, the fact that you have people in those churches who are all over the spectrum, but who are serving alongside each other and who are, they are definitely exposed at least sometimes to these kinds of conversations, conversations that you might imagine would pull someone who you would stereotypically think of as being a, let's just all come together and say kumbaya, right? Um, and make them uncomfortable. There's at least some space where they're having this mutual conversation and dialogue. So there, the, the good news for, for those of us who are pastors and leaders is that there's space, right, to actually be intentional in the way we use that to form folks who are there. So I, hope, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's, that's kind of the argument. Uh, well, thank you. Very much appreciate that. Thank you, Michelle. Um, we're going to take another break. Just to remind you, if you're not familiar with Niagara Hall, it's bathrooms upstairs, downstairs. 
that should be carried around the back end of the building, but it's not that far away. So go up or down. Um, we're going to take four minutes again. I said four, and I know you're going to go longer. <laughs> try, to, try, try to do what you can do. Here's the refreshments. Yes, and there's still some refreshments in the wonderful, beautiful kitchen here. Thank you. See you back in a few minutes.
<laughs> Before we hear from our next presenter, I do want to thank you all again for coming. And um, one of you, I know the crowd is stand a little bit, but are there folks here who uh, are not like normally here, like you aren't a student or a faculty member? If that's the case, could you raise your hand? Folks, I really want to thank you for coming. <laughs> I don't know what anyone's plan is for, for gauging people's um, responses to this event, but one of our faculty members just came up and said, well, I like this. We need to do this more often. And I'm like, yes, we need to do this more often. So I'm very excited about what's happening today. And, and right now, I have the privilege of introducing our final presenter, is Dr. Hannah Andre, the Wilma E. Peterson Chair of Church History and Dean of Faculty. And she'll be speaking on purposeful narrative, covenant history, past, present, and future. Please welcome Dr. Don. How's everyone doing? In number three. Yeah. Uh, save the best for life. <laughs> I have to say that. The historians always are, uh, I don't know. Having to make up for something. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, thank you. Thank you all for being here. Um, thanks to my colleagues. Um, I learned so much and have all my own questions that I look forward to following up with in the presentation. But um, it's a huge honor to be part of, of this faculty. Um, thank you all um, for being here. Um, I want to acknowledge that this chair position um, is a new position. And it's an honor to accept it as a newly created Wilma E. Peterson Chair in Church History. And I think it's especially poignant and fitting that this new um, endowed position for history is made possible by a woman whose lifetime of service and generosity exemplifies so well the quiet faithfulness that makes up so much of history, and especially the history of the church. I'm going to talk about a number of um, names that will be familiar to you um, just because of names, locations on this campus. But if you step outside um, Olson Lounge, there's a plaque. Um, that acknowledges the work of the Covenant Women's Auxiliary um, in building this campus as they built so much um, of the Covenant Church as well. The decision of our senior leadership at North Park to allocate this chair to history with the dedicated emphasis on denominational history, I think is also highly significant. At a time when universities and seminaries are cutting history from positions and curricula, and when many denominations are muting historical ties, even as we're at a time where historical amnesia is especially prevalent, and historical insight and sensibilities, I think, especially necessary. While this is a new um, chair position, the decision to formalize North Park's commitment to Christian history and to the particular history of our denomination honors the critical contributions of the covenant historians who have worked faithfully across the entirety of our school's history. David Nival, Eric Hawkinson, Carl Olson, Glenn Anderson, and my immediate predecessor, Phil Anderson. And we're all indebted to the careful, purposeful work that they have done to root us in careful collective memory. And their work, in turn, I promise I'll move on to content. And it's not like, you know, you look at a page and then like, actually that takes a long time. <laughs> but I want to say, I can't move on without saying their work, in turn, has depended on um, a whole series of archivists. Um, and I'm wearing my archive shirt. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
we have a whole series first of um, volunteer archivists, John Peterson, Gustav, E. Gustav Johnson, Eric Hawkinson, Milton Friedholm, and Sigurd Westberg, followed by, since 1987, um, a series of professional archivists, Timothy Johnson, Ellen Engseth, Steve Eldy, Ann Jenner, Anna Kaisa Anderson, and now Andy Meyer, who's with us today. So each of these archivists has built on the work of previous archivists with the support of the Covenant History Commission. And we'll learn. Oh, I have a picture for that. There's a some other photos of historians that meant to accompany that. Mm -hmm. In 2004, the Evangelical Covenant Church adopted the five-fold test. The goal of this test was to move past viewing ethnic and racial diversity as a matter only of numbers, point that Michelle has just made, um, the P, the first P in the test, population, and ensure true diversity in the very fabric of the denomination as such through further attention to participation, power, case setting, and purposeful narrative. More recently, a sixth P has been added. But I'm a historian, so I can't talk about that yet. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's not in the, the realm of history. But I, <laughs> I do, I recognize that. <laughs> but the, the fifth P, purposeful narrative, asked, how do the stories of new backgrounds become incorporated into our overarching history? How do all of these streams flow together into one story moving forward? In now the decade that I've been at North Park teaching, um, <laughs> but half, in my time at North Park, half of the 20 years that has passed since the adoption of the five-fold test. In my experience, the call to purposeful narrative is frequently invoked and very rarely enacted. Mm -hmm. So one thing I wanna, the, the main thing that I wanna do in this lecture is first to contextualize that call and ultimately to concretize the corollary commitments that are prerequisite, prerequisite to actualizing it. I want to look at what kinds of, what larger infrastructure or ecosystem is required to allow any history to be written to whatever purpose. <laughs> And so I'm going to do that through some snapshots of the intersection of denominational identity and historiography at two key anniversaries, and then raise some questions as we look ahead to the 150th anniversary, which is just over 10 years from now, in 2035. When the Covenant gathered in 1935 to celebrate its 50th anniversary, it was in the midst of a crucial transition. The founding generation was yielding to second generation leaders, and English was increasingly eclipsing Swedish as the denomination's lingua franca. It's kind of weird to say. The Covenant had been founded in 1885 by a very small subset of a much larger Swedish migration that peaked in the 1880s. Amid a rise in nativism that met the waves of new immigrants coming increasingly from Eastern and Southern Europe in the 1880s into the 20th century. I, that broader context, even that Dr. Lee mentioned right, in the anti-Asian immigration legislation. This 
political cartoon was published in 1899 and depicts a sense of the climate. Um, when we'll turn to some text written by David Neville. But the, um, the cartoon depicts Uncle Sam saying, why should I let these freaks cast full votes when they're only half American? Right, so illustrating a broader move against even any kind of hyphenated identity. So I think it's significant that in that same year, David Nywall, then president of North Park um, College and Seminary, defended the ethnic specificity of North Park as an immigrant school in the Chicago press against charges that North Park's retention of Swedish language and communal cohesion only served to delay assimilation, and so was fundamentally un-American. David Nigel responded in the Chicago press, defending the school's ethnic particularity and rejecting the concept of uncritical assimilation. He said, some people seem to think that the best way to be Americanized is to lose track of ourselves in the wilderness of a strange country the quickest possible. I think the contrary. I think that we ought to know a great deal more about this country before it is safe to break up company with another. <laughs> Skipping, ellipsis. <laughs> this institution, North Park, this is writing in 1899, will have no kind of a future, but on the condition that it is now thoroughly Swedish. This is, however, no protest against the school being at the same time thoroughly American. We have a narrow conception of what is Swedish if we think that it is in opposition to what is truly American. And so defending a hyphenated identity. Now I will, and I, I have to say, so I think it's Carl Olson, I don't know who's watching this can fact check me, but, um, who said that this whole school is the length and shadow of David Nyball. So I have to give him some disproportionate time in the, in the talk. Amen. But he said that this, this um, school's future success depended on its being thoroughly Swedish until the community, um, the immigrant community mastered English or else they risked losing the full content of what they could express mm -hmm. and bring. And he said, this is a quote, it would be very bad economy to empty ourselves too early before we're sure not to spill out the hole because lacking vessels to pour ourselves into. I was thinking linguistically, but more broadly. And so in general, Nigel impressed upon the covenant, the whole covenant denomination and at school, the importance of the second generation maintaining Swedish language rather than rushing into um, Americanization, thus they squander the wisdom of generations like the prodigal son, lest they end up orphaned Americans and their parents childless Swedes. Mm -hmm. That's the analogy he gave. In, narr in narrating the identity of um, the covenant to his own people within Swedish American um, periodicals, Nigel was even more um, direct. All that I just said was in English in um, broader publications. In his ongoing defense of North Park as a school for Swedes, he said, I just keep quoting Nigel, I promise I'll move on from him. We shall not be assimilated because we shall not be Americanized. By making the best of what we are now, we can best educate the nation in America. If we are good Swedes in an apolitical sense, we are good Americans. Americanization is not becoming less and less Swedish. It is not disposing of an iota of our language or even one good and noble custom. It is not forgetting the good that I know nor the language I speak, rather it is the opposite, making the best of me in a new place by mastering the new language, the language of this country. In speaking to um, 
outsider audience of the church of the covenant at the world parliament of religions held in what is now the art institute um, as part of the world Columbian exposition in 1893 Nigel defended the use of swedish within congregations rejecting interpretations of retention of swedish in worship specifically um, as it was seen externally as a stubborn insularity or political disloyalty at the time. And I think in this context, his strategy is interesting. He appeals both um, to Reformation commitments, to read scripture in the vernacular, and also to the express family values of the context in saying we do not feel there can be anything anti-American and that children learn to speak the only language their mother understands. He said that many in the covenant, in covenant congregations only spoke Swedish and that even if they had some English capacity, it was merely quote, a possession of the tongue rather than the thought and much, rather than thought and much less the heart. And so he said, for the purposes of worship, quote, we are served only by one language, which all understand and all understand well, and that's Swedish. I, I belabor this point not only because of Nigel's length and shadow and my own specific love for him and appreciation for his prescience, but because I believe actually that all of us here are the fulfillment of Nigel's original vision. And that's true in the covenant denomination as well. But also because I think it's important that we see this early ethnic identity of the covenant, not firstly, or primarily, or maybe not even at all, as a kind of exclusionary ethnocentricism, but rather as a not uncontroversial, in this context, insistence on the value of particularity of ethnic culture against pressure to a quick assimilation or a pressure, even invitation to simply abandon that culture. So that's some background as we come to 1930, 1935, as the covenant is celebrating its 50th anniversary. I mentioned that at this point, they're encountering generational change and linguistic transition. And here are some um, illustrative dates to mark that broader, much longer, and uneven transition that takes place over these decades. Two years prior to the 50th anniversary in 1935, T.W. Anderson had been elected as the first American-born covenant president. And he was fully fluent in both Swedish and English, and therefore um, equipped to lead the church in and through this transition. The following year, 1936, the name of the denomination would be changed from Swedish Evangelical Mission Covenant in America to Evangelical Covenant Church of America. Anniversaries, um, especially big anniversaries, like quarter centuries and half centuries and centennials, tend to generate historical reflection. They cause groups to take stock of the paths of change and continuity that have led to their current identity at that anniversary milestone, and to consider what aspects of that past they want to carry into the future. And this was true at the Covenant's 50th anniversary. As President T.W. Anderson reflected on a half century of covenant history and looked ahead with anticipation to a new chapter of mission, in a collection of published reflections, um, covenant memories, it was a 50-year book commissioned in anticipation of the 50th anniversary. Um, and in his opening contribution to that history, Covenant Principles, T.W. Anderson began, begins by noting the significant changes that have taken place within the denomination over the past 50 years. And chief among them 
the transition from the first generation to the second generation, an increasing use of English. Following the reduced flow of immigration and an increased or renewed focus on the youth and discipleship of the youth. He describes as saying this, the change is inevitable and not that this is a quote. He says change is inevitable and not necessarily regrettable. Living movements are not static, but adapt themselves to new conditions. But in the context of the change that he describes, he points to what he calls the covenant's fundamental principles which remain unchanged in spite of the broader internal and external changes. And he names these as the supremacy of the Bible, the necessity of spiritual life, belief in the unity of all true Christians, the independence of the local church, and finally, the urgency of the missionary task. And it's in this final section, the urgency of the missionary task, that T.W. Anderson indicates a shift in covenant home mission enabled by the collapse of the language barrier. And he celebrates the whole new mission field that is open to the covenant. Now that its domestic work is no longer limited to lang Swedish language speakers, but instead can be directed to the nation as a whole. And so he says, with the language barriers eliminated, there are open doors on every hand. Free from sectarian bias, believing in the church as a spiritual home for all Christians, the covenant is particularly qualified for this frontier work. Emphasizing the central truths of the historic Christian faith, as we earnestly desire to do, we are convinced that God has a commission for us at our very doors. The greatest opportunities in the half century of our brief history are challenging us. So notice what he does here. Right? He grounds the covenant in its founding identity as a mission organization, celebrates the expanded mission field that's open. It's a 10 minutes. Uh, it looks easy when you're sitting there. <laughs> um, Okay. <laughs> so um, he celebrates right this new new capacity to worship, to serve, to evangelize in English, and and he frames covenant and identity, um, the purpose of the covenant as a faith community, not in its ethnic identity, but precisely in terms of its founding principles. Right? And he says this is what will take the covenant into. The next 50 years, and this is the essential identity of the covenant. Okay, and I'm gonna probably, I, I will just add the refrain to every section, like we could say more. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the main point here, actually, <laughs> um, okay. so I mentioned that in anticipation of the anniversary. There was a, a commissioned um, historic, historiographical work, reflection, commissioned and executed. Additionally, at this 50th anniversary, 50th anniversary, the denomination made deliberate provisions for the ongoing collection and care of archival records in order to enable the ongoing historiography as they observe the first generation giving way to the second. In 1935, the Covenant History Commission was established. The longest standing Covenant Commission, wow. still in existence, wow. co commission. <laughs> it was commissioned to steward historical records. And it actively, you can read uh, in the yearbook reports, reports of the commission where they're asking churches and pastors, like, send us your stuff. Right? So they solicited. Um, materials and began to, to catalog and organize those and make them accessible. Originally, the archival um, collections were held both in Old Main here on campus 
and also in the Covenant offices as it moved from First Belmont Avenue to Francisco. Nyball Hall, this building right down here, Nyball, um, was built in 1947. And this wing, you'll see outside, um, carved in Meliander Library, until the until Walgren, let me do it, I need someone to go through. Walgren Library, which was right here before Randell Library was um, built. This used to be a library and the archives was held in the classroom right above us. That's what these images are. Through the work of an active history commission and dedicated volunteer archivists, sources at this juncture were collected, organized, translated, and interpreted through commission publications. The breakdown of the language barrier, the disintegration of the ethnic boundary, and the resulting potential for an expanded mission, an expanded church that T.W. Anderson had celebrated at the 50th anniversary became a reality over the next half century. This took place in no small part through suburban growth in the post-war period. Covenant participation in the burgeoning suburbs reinforced, oops, our speeder, no, reinforced the erosion of an overt ethnic identity. As congregations moved out of historically Swedish urban neighborhoods, they became community churches, attracting people with no historical ties to the denomination or any Scandinavian heritage. Given the racist lending and development policies underlying the creation of segregated suburbs and reinforced by them, Initial post war expansion took place primarily among white Americans. Yet, slowly but increasingly, the covenant also expanded beyond a majority white population. And this expansion took place through church adoptions. For example, Grace Covenant Church in Compton, planted by Robert Dawson. Through racial transitions of historically Swedish American congregations mirroring racially changing neighborhoods, as Black Americans moved into northern cities in the Great Migration and white flight took hold, for example, Oakdale Covenant Church, and through parallel Latino church plans within established congregations, for example, Douglas Park, and many others in California. Actually, I'll show you composite list. Largely through the result of intentional church planting and adoption strategies of the intervening decades spearheaded by the Department of Church Growth and Evangelism in partnership with an Urban and Ethnic Ministries Commission, by 1979, the covenant totaled I didn't do it until 11. Now I have to do math on the spot. Well, oh, say, and a total of one Estonian, four African American, five Korean, eight Latino congregations, together comprising 3.5% of the total 544 covenant congregations at that time in 1979. I'm really skip now because okay what I'm really going to say here as the covenant anticipated what as the covenant anticipated its 100th anniversary in 1985 in light of the significant demographic expansion that had taken place between 1935 and 1985 it grappled again with its ethnic history and present identity, actively questioning how to effectively integrate all ethnic communities, racial communities, both European and non-European. This was an active conversation, including people, just anyone who was like, I'm not Swedish. Right? And also what role its own 
particular ethnic past should have in an increasingly multi-ethnic future. In 1979, a resolution was brought um, in anticipation, uh, significantly from the Association of Developer Pastors. This is a precursor to sugar planters. That indicates the extent of a residual Swedishness that shaped the dominant culture in ways more noticeable and at times alienating to new covenanters without any Scandinavian heritage. And you can read that. I'm not going to read it. The main, you can read the background, but the main resolution that we make a conscious effort no longer to assume Swedish American culture to be the norm for the covenant. Right? This is in 1979. <laughs> okay, see it. No. The final thing before I move on from the centennial is that as with the 50th, as with the 50th um, anniversary, publications were commissioned in anticipation. Historical works um, by one spirit was commissioned in advance of the 75th anniversary, 75th, yeah. It was completed over seven years, two years after the anniversary that it sought to um, mark in 1960. A two volume history was uh, came out in conjunction with the centennial. And there were also additional publications, journals, discussions around history and identity and ethnicity at this time. So, Okay, <laughs> so all of this is to say, as we come to the five bull test in 2004, it's helpful for us to recognize that the questions that we ask, that we're asking, aren't new questions. They might take on new forms, but the question about um, identity, ethnicity, goes back to the beginning of the combination. And our engagement with these questions today is enriched through our close and particular attention to these earlier stages of growth, development, and transition. But the real thing I wanted to say is what is required for any narrative to happen? And the answer to that is sources. And the reality is that even as I hear many calls for a new history, for a new violent spirit, for a purposeful narrative, concurrent with those calls, there are trends at play that are jeopardizing the very possibility of doing any kind of history. All of the historians that we draw from in the covenant in turn drew from a deep well of sources. I made this little infographic myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, <laughs> What does it take to get a by one spirit? Right? History doesn't, I said this yesterday about the Bible, but it's true about by one spirit too, <laughs> is that it doesn't drop from the sky. Right? We're only able to do history if we have sources that we can interpret. And if we look at, as an example, some trends, Oh, not unless I heard this off. Oh, no, you're disagreeing with what I'm saying. If we look at some trends, which I can thank um, Andy for sending to me and Meyer, this illustrates in linear feet the current archival holdings for our presidents going back to T.W. Anderson, right, in the beginning of the History Commission. Many underlying trends explain these numbers. One, is shifts in shift toward digital communication and publication. 
I, we can be lured into an illusion that information, we have tons of sources because there's so much information. But in fact, digital emails, records, websites make those sources more ephemeral than ever. Mm -hmm. Similarly, think, I mean, if you could think about um, a congregation, your own work life, and what kinds of records you're producing. And 50 years from now, if anyone will be able to tell the history of a decision, of a congregation, right? The article that Michelle mentioned on the Black Manifesto was possible because of Milton Engelbrecht's presidential files. How will we be able to tell the history of the five-fold test? When in fact, very early this morning, when I went online to find even a record that I had cited in a different article, it says page not found, mm -hmm. right? That just illustrates mm -hmm. the tenuousness of our source, um, our sources right now. So, let me find something to read so I don't just keep that living. <laughs> and then I'll have everyone included. Commitment to a personal narrative requires a corollary commitment to the creation, management, and preservation of sources. Right? Without sources, there's no narrative. So as we look ahead to 2035, the 150th anniversary of the covenant, what sources will we have to tell that story, to tell the history of 2010, 2020? The real evidence that a community, a denomination is committed to purposeful narrative is not merely the assertion of that commitment, nor even critiques of past or possible histories, but rather active creation and preservation sources and realistic commissioning of histories. And this isn't the work of a single historian, but depends on broader infrastructures. And a community with historical sensitivity attuned and equipped to be history keepers. How am I gonna end? Okay, this is how I'm gonna end. Cicero. <laughs> Rome, to be ignorant of what occurred before you were born is to remain forever a child. Mm -hmm. Every child believes the world began with them, and every parent knows that to be false. If we don't attend to our history as a denomination, if we come to questions of identity as though we're the first to be asking them, mm -hmm without considering how covenanters have asked or answered them, we replicate this childish myopia. We need historical understanding to inoculate us from the myth that what is new to us is new, mm -hmm. from poor stewardship that reinvents wheels rather than wisely stewarding the past toward the future. So I've sought to show that our current discourse is not asking totally new questions, but revisiting questions that have been asked. We're indebted to hundreds of covenant history keepers and historians whose careful work has enabled the rich historical record that we have. And we bear a responsibility to those who follow us to ensure that they will know the history that we are creating right now. And that depends on providing the next generation with sources that we are creating. So I want to give the last word to Wilma Peterson, but I'm too afraid to try to do a video right now. <laughs> so I'm just going to quote her. Oh, let me try to do it. You're going to do it. I can do that. Yeah, it would. Here you go. That's going to work. 
See, it's not going to work. Oh. So I knew it. There's always something. Oh, you're, 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 you're muted. There you go. Unmuted. There you go. Then you, then you got it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Great responsibility for while we we the world will accelerate and then generate the law. All right. I like basically only did have what I was gonna do, but <laughs> maybe no questions that we'll listen. <laughs> Is up there is food for thought to invite a question so I can say what I really want to know. Yeah, Dave. <laughs> not a plan. Uh, <laughs> how, how would you encourage denominations or seminaries to um, ensure that we do have the resources and the sources necessary um, to uh, ensure yeah. uh, interpretive texts that will be rich as we have seen in the past? Great question. Thank you for allowing me to answer that. <laughs> we don't want to know the answer. Let me I might defer the question to Andy, but I would say um, a short answer relates to this flow chart that I tried to create, right? That we don't get into uh, like survey texts but we have a lot of specialized articles and we can't do that unless we actually have sources to look at. So it's all about source creation and source preservation. So I think some practical steps, especially relate to the shift toward digital, born digital files. And it's a huge dilemma for everyone, um, digital records management. Right? So one short answer is to invest in digital record management. And that's, Andy, do you want to say anything else about that specifically? Oh, um, there's lots of details there yeah. that we can get into, but yeah, that paradigm shift in the archival field has been monumental. We're not alone in struggling to deal with that. But um, but yeah, the projects I work at now in the archives are dealing with digital records we see 15 years ago because floppy disks and hard drives, they all have shorter lifespans than books and paper on the shelf. We have these mm -hmm. records to deal with those. There's books and paper. They can sit for 50 years and I can pick up a book and read it, but you know, think about your own life, two floppy disks. I'm not going to go through one 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So that's where the records are, that's where our projects are. So along with that, is a, you know, a, book, a book I read recently. Nothing uh, has been preserved, only things being preserved, which calls into question mm -hmm. the traditional resources for these things infrastructure, yeah. technology infrastructure, adapting policies, procedures, um, access, um, the, the ability to kind of uh, show your work, for lack of a better word. So, removing the fear of character um, records. Yeah. But yeah. I see that institutional changes. So, for example, the public has a marketing department now, and not an institutional department or a publishing department. I understand the reality. I understand part of the reality that you need to market, but that's different than publishing. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, so um, <clears throat> thinking about how. I mean, there's so many underlying converging shifts that lead to a chart like I showed with the presidential records. One of them does relate to the shift toward digital records. Also, there's different staffing structures. Milton Engelbretson, like if someone has a secretary that's copying all their work and transferring it, and there's, there's workflows to send things into the archives, that's another area. Support of the archives. I mean, you can hear from that, whatever that was, two minutes, one minute, right? This is where our expertise is. Um, so always support of the archives. But then to think as you're doing your work, am I taking records? Am I taking minutes, right? This is an institutional history. Where are the minutes and where are the minutes going? Making sure things get to the archives. I think I'll just say one more thing and then, and then stop. Um, but I say this in history classes, our tendency when we think about sources, 
is to imagine sources missing. Like, why aren't these sources here? But the real question is why we have any sources at all, right? And that relates to who decides what is a source, what to do with it, how to preserve it, and ultimately to send it somewhere where it can be preserved in the case of this institutional history, our archives. Those are some. I, I just want to add an anecdotal note that one of the toughest things about intercultural reading is the Bible is the sources. And one of the best sources is whenever sermons are somehow preserved. Mm -hmm. um, so the, our, the Japanese American Service Center actually has some sermons from Japanese pastors in internment, which were really mm -hmm. illuminating. And so um, I would say that some of our best. Um, Preaching are examples of intercultural reading the Bible, mm -hmm. and it's really hard to access. Yeah. Uh, so, so maybe the audio file now, but that's not the same thing as having read that in there. And and so we think of like we've talked about um, like digital text-based files, right? Where the digital is especially relevant. But sources are much broader than just documentary sources. They can also be oral sources. Or, right. I mean, that introduces a whole host of issues in terms of preservation, in terms of file format. Um, but I will make a plug to say, it, in our desire to preserve sources, to answer Dave's question in another way, is oral history collection. Mm -hmm. And I can give a shout out to my covenant history students for building this collection and also for the archives for receiving it. I don't know what we're up to now, but it's over 150 mm -hmm. interviews. And so many of these narrators have passed away, mm -hmm. right? And so this too is um, an ephemeral resource. And then lastly, because the altar call at the end of this is to become a history keeper, these are resources that have been produced by the archive, our archives in conjunction with the History Commission and the resources to guide um, congregations, individuals in collecting oral histories and also in creating congregational archives. Right? So, so another thing past and present, we've thought about like um, top-down institutional records, mm -hmm. but also in the past, there's a huge tradition of congregational histories. One of the digital collections that our archives archivist has faithfully digitized that you can access is one of anniversary histories, right? Where there are historians and local congregations telling the history of their congregations. That's something that we could revive. Right? So each congregation too should be preserving their records. And I think especially for new church plans for adoptions um, to say, could would anyone be able to tell the history of our church in 50 years? How would they do that? Hmm. All right, I can talk for a little. <laughs> we have time for a couple more questions. Oh, even better. <laughs> Never mind. So, as we try to get the stories of people in our congregations who are at that age where, you know, we don't know if they'll be present, um, is it an oral history that? You can gather or video or you can do both. Yeah, I would say oral history, but it can be um, just voice or it could also be voice video. Yeah, both are possible. Even I mean, you can you can oh, I don't want to go there anymore. But if you explore this collection, um, you can see if there's any number of different formats. Just voice. Sometimes people are just even using Zoom and recording a Zoom call mm -hmm. to capture the face, like. And you can do it through a recorder in your phone. And you don't have to have like a formal setup. The one thing I'll say, since I'm making a plug for the archives right now, if you're doing this, one of the documents in that pamphlet is a release form so that they can say how they want the history to be used that Andy needs if he's going to access it in the collection. Yeah. So, Michelle, you had a question. Yeah. So, where, like, where are you, oh, are you hopeful? And then, if so, where is the hope in um, the way that we're able to tell our story in 50 years and 100 years? I don't that faith that you said. Well, I mean, mm -hmm. 